One cool thing just about the song uh, we just sang is I love that bridge at the end, uh, You Have Overcome. And there's something cool about the doctrine of salvation, um, and that is that on this campus there are people who God not only will save, but has, is, is going to save. It's an actual thing, and, and how he plans to do it is through us sharing the gospel. No one's going to become saved sitting under a tree, musing on dirt. They're going to become saved because Christians take initiative and they go and talk to them about it and they introduce the gospel to them. And I just want to let you guys know next week um, is one of, there's a lot of really poignant gospel passages um, in Romans. Next week we're in Romans 5, 1 through 11. Uh, so it's a great message to bring your friends to because it's, it gets at the hope of the gospel. Um, it gets at the joy of Christianity. It gets at the beauty of Christ. So um, next, if there's ever a week to invite your roommate, your friend, or your coworker to GCF, next week is it. And so I encourage you to do that. Um, that's the easiest way to start a process of evangelism. So keep that in mind. If you haven't noticed, uh, while being on this campus, you have roommates, you have friends, you have coworkers, as I just mentioned, and a lot of them are from different backgrounds um, and also from different religions on campus. They're all over the place. And this is a good thing in one sense. There are Muslims, there are Jews, there are Hindus, Brahmins, Buddhists, Catholics, secular humanists, atheists, spiritualists, Native Americans, uh, ancestor, ancestral religion. All this kind of stuff is weaving around our campus. Um, and I'm always awkward when it comes to dealing with people from other religions, not because I'm just an awkward person in general. So you can ask my wife about how we started dating and you'll see that firsthand. Um, but I always, when I encounter people from different religions, I know why what I believe is right, but I don't know how to engage other people in a dialogue about religion. Um, now, not every time I meet somebody of a different religion do I want to get in a theological argument with them, but if they ever start talking about the differences, sometimes I don't know what it is. Like when a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness knocks on my door, I know they should be wrong, but I don't really know why they're wrong. And I just kind of stand there and ask awkward questions and sweat a lot, and I'm like, ah, I got Jesus, bye. Um, and, and as I was thinking about it, this is for, for you guys and for, for me even as I interact with you guys on campus, this is one of the times where you'll be exposed to the most religions in your lifetime, the most amount of people from different backgrounds, and this is a great time where we need to answer the question and be aware of what makes Christianity distinct? Why is Christianity right? What does it mean when it says Christianity is the only way? And what Paul is doing is, is there's, there's an important question we can begin to ask which starts to have a fundamental shift with any sort of uh, other religion. If you want to see what that religion is about, this is one question where we start drifting into directions that help us gain clarification. And that question is, what must we do to be saved? All religions have some sort of God and some sort of belief system, but they all exist for some purpose. So, so in that religious system, what does it mean to be saved? You ask that to Mormons, and they will be saved, saved through faith and works. And actually, they'll look at the text we're looking at today, and they say something opposite of what Paul is going to actually put out there. Jehovah's Witnesses, they say there are four main things that need to happen in order for you to be saved. You need to have accurate knowledge you need to avoid a specific amount of kind of token sins. If you do those sins, you're not going to be saved. Um, you need to become a member of some sort of uh, a Jehovah's Witness society. And you must practice proselytism or evangelism. Uh, you, you talk to Muslims, and Muslims will say, what must you do to be saved? And they say three things. They say, worship Allah and Allah alone. And when they say that, they say, uh, Allah is God, but you can't worship Jesus. You can't worship any other intermediate. It's, it's Allah and only Allah, and that's where you'll be saved. In addition to that, you have to live in accordance with the Quran. And any time you sin or depart from the Quran, you have to repent in that moment always continually for the rest of your life of that sin. It's a continual process of looking at where you've strayed and coming back and praising Allah. So where does Christianity fit in here? What must you do if you claim to be Christian, if you're examining Christianity, what must you do to be saved? And Paul has been already in Romans framing our discussion. Romans 1.17 is kind of the, the token verse of what Paul is saying in this book where he says this, For in this, in what? In this the righteousness of God um, is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, 
the righteous shall live by faith. Paul's saying here, Christians will live by faith. What we just saw last week, um, Romans 3, 23 through 25, he says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteous forbearance in passing over former sins. So, so Christians are saved by faith. This is, this is the classic um, long-term Reformation doctrine of what's called sola fide, faith alone. Now, the Christian life, certainly, when we say faith alone, it, means, it doesn't mean faith and nothing else is sufficient for the Christian. But it certainly includes more than faith in regards of what it means to live as a Christian, to act like a Christian, and think like a Christian. But the baseline, the lowest common denominator, the lowest bar of what it means to be Christian is faith. Belief in Jesus. So what does that mean? What, what does it mean to have faith? We can have faith in a lot of things. I can have faith in the Titans. That's bad faith. I can have faith in gravity. That's sufficient faith. We can have faith in many things, but, but what does it work as a Christian? What does it mean for you to have faith? Does that mean you pray once and you're in forever? Is that faith? Does that mean if you screw up once, that's a lap of faith, and now you need to reapply kind of to God's social security system and hopefully get back in? Because if we're to have faith, we need to know what that means. And tonight Paul is going to, to really give us one of, his, what is one of his more full explanations of faith alone in the book of Romans. And this is what we're going to see. Christian faith is a wonderful declaration of righteousness rooted in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So we're going to kind of split that up and look at the declaration component and the person and work um, of Jesus tonight. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you um, for who you are. We thank you for what you've done in our life. We thank you for the, the program of salvation you've put forward in Jesus Christ and how um, if, if man was in charge of writing a program, we would never write this. But you have written it for our joy, for our benefit, and for your glory. And so God, help us understand what faith means, not merely as an intellectual idea, but also as a way of life. So when Paul says the righteous will live by faith, we know exactly what that means, not only in thoughts, but in life, in living, in affection, and in doing. So grant us that grace and mercy today as we look at your text. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So the wonderful thing about um, studying faith, you can't really study Christianity with running into salvation by faith. And the cool thing about it is it's not just something we observe as something apart from us. Like faith is this observable thing we have to study and understand. But actually, as we get to know our faith, as we examine what a biblical role of faith is, we actually see that it shapes and informs the whole of our life. It's not static. It's active. It's dynamic. It's engaging us. It's laboring on us. And one of the most wonderful but underrated aspects of the Christian faith is that it's this. Faith is a declaration of something amazing. Faith is a declaration of something amazing. Let's look um, at what Paul says in the last part of chapter 3. So we just ended with this beautiful gospel proclamation. Then he says this, Then what becomes of our boasting? It's excluded. By what kind of law? What, what makes us not be able to boast? Is it the law of works? No, but the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow this law by faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. So this section, as I was writing the sermon, I, I, I dubbed this section a declaration of something amazing. Now, we have a tendency as humans, when we see a declaration of something amazing, we like to think that we're declaring something about ourselves. If something amazing happens in our life, don't we generally tend to declare it? Um, I don't know how many people play fantasy football in here. I don't care if you won. I really don't. And 
I talk about it like you should care that I won in fantasy football, and you talk about it like I should care that you won in fantasy football, but no one really cares about your fantasy football. And yet we declare it to everyone. Look at me, my fake team won. One of my six. And we think it's something amazing, or we, but we, we declare how good our grades are. We declare so many things, but here's the beauty of faith, is that Paul immediately points to your salvation. He says, where's your boasting? You see, the beauty of faith is it's not declaring something about us, but it's declaring something about God. You see, we can't boast in our faith. Why can't we boast? Paul's answering these questions as he's imagining us saying them. He says, because we're not justified by the law. We're justified by faith. And so Paul's going to spend some time saying, what's this difference between justified by the law, justified by faith? One can boast in the law. One can't boast in faith. What does it mean? Why is it relevant that we can't boast in faith? And see, faith is amazing because its power isn't that we declare something about ourselves through faith. But the power is that God declares for us something to be true through faith. Faith isn't something we say about ourselves. Faith is something God says about us. And Paul gives an example of this. He's going to um, talk about this guy named Abraham. I don't know how many of you grew up in Christian backgrounds and you know who Abraham is. Abraham uh, was to the Jews what George Washington is to Americans. He was their founder. He was the, the founding father of Israel, the, the chosen one, the token standard of what it meant to be a Jew. He was revered second only to God himself as they looked at figures in the Old Testament. And he stood as this picture of righteousness, right? And Paul's been defining righteousness. Righteousness means to be in right standing before God. And so to talk about Abraham is to talk about like teacher's pet, okay? Abraham got it. He obeyed. He followed. He trusted. Abraham was the one whom God loved and lived rightly with God. But Abraham is kind of throwing a wrench in the typical narrative of how these Jews would view Abraham. And we see that in chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. He says this, What shall we say was gained by Abraham, our father, according to the flesh? In other words, what did Abraham do in and of himself? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as as righteousness, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Then he quotes David saying, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. So he's asking this question to the Jews. It's a little irrelevant for us because we're not really Jewish in looking back at this, but he's, he's going to bring it around to us in a second. So he says, you Jews, why is Abraham justified? Why is Abraham the founder of your people? Why is Abraham in right relationship with God? If that's what you want, let's look at Abraham. If Abraham had the relationship with God everybody wants, we should examine why that is. Did you see that? Look at 4 verse 3. For what does the scripture say? Abraham obeyed God, followed God, trusted God. It says Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And so Paul is, he's in this logic, uh, arguing with these Jews, and he's already thinking of what the Jews would say next. No, Abraham, Abraham wasn't justified because he believed. I mean, he believed, yeah, 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 yeah. But he also obeyed, right? God said, Abraham, go to the land I'm going to show you, right? He had no roadmap, but he just trusted God, and he went. And he said, he said, Abraham, you need to be circumcised. That's not something most men jump straight into, um, but Abraham did it. I mean, and so, so, yeah, Abraham believed, but he also did a lot of stuff to where God's like, this is a guy I should stick with, right? This guy has, has answered every test I've given him, and he's proved worthy of being the founder of this nation, this guy I want to make my covenant with. He passed the interview process. Abraham was saved because he proved worthy to be saved. That's Ab- Father Abraham. They're going to make stupid songs about him for aeons. He had many sons. But look at what Paul says later about the order of operations in 4.9, the second part, um, through 10. 
For we say faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. And sure enough, we look at the Old Testament, Genesis 15, 6. So this is important to pay attention to numbers. Genesis 15, 6 says this. It says, and he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. Okay? Genesis 15, we see that line that Paul is quoting here. How is Abraham righteous in this passage? Belief. He believed in the Lord and it was counted to him as righteous. Only later in Genesis 17, two chapters later, does Abraham receive the sign of circumcision. So he's like, Abraham wasn't justified before God because he obeyed and was circumcised. He was justified two chapters before that. He was declared righteous in his belief. And Paul goes on to then give us an example that we all can understand as poor college students, right? He says this, if your grandma, I'm kind of adding something to Paul's text. Uh, if your grandma sends you a $20 bill in a birthday card, what did you do to deserve that? Nothing. You were born. <laughs> Congratulations. Nothing. It's a gift to you. You don't expect that. Your grandma's not do that. If you still get $20 from your grandma, that's great, but it's going to stop. I hate to shatter your dreams. It is. And if it doesn't stop because your grandma forgets, there's another way it's going to stop. And you have to come to grips with that. Grandmas get old, okay? I have two still. I love them both. Um, they don't send me money anymore. They send my children money. Uh, and so here's the thing. $20 in a card from grandma, that's a gift. If you show up to work one day and you work eight hours and you don't get a paycheck by the end of that, you're not like, no, 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 don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Why? It's your work. It's your due. It's what you expect from that. You don't, you don't get a paycheck and be like, are, are you for real? Like, you don't, you, don't ha you don't have to do that. I just rolled 140 cinnamon rolls today. You don't have to do that. No, you're like, yeah, okay, give me the money. It's your wage. It's what's due. It's what you've earned rightly. And so Paul is applying this logic to Abraham. And if he said Abraham was justified because of his works, he didn't receive a gift of salvation. This is the first problem. Remember what we looked at last week in, in Romans 3.24? It says, um, and are justified by his grace as a gift. So if Abraham did something to merit God's righteousness, if he did something where God says, this guy, this guy's going to be it. I see some promise. He's in my farm leagues. He's wandering around in the desert. That's my guy. That's not a gift. It was his due. That's not God being gracious. That's God being frugal in selecting Abraham. But look at Romans 4, 5, and 8. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. You see this language? Paul's not mixing it here. There's, there's a lot of words distancing faith from works. And he says this, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. You see the scandal here. There's some, if you guys watch Law and Order, okay, our red flag should be going up right now because there's some shady justice happening in this text, isn't there? See, God is declaring the ungodly righteous apart from works. Did you hear that? It's not that God finds somebody who's ungodly. They work to cover up their sin. God inspects them in front of a courtroom and says, yeah, you're good. You see, it's not because of what they did that God declares them righteous. And, and then he goes on to say, King, he talks about King David, and he quotes King David. Um, and, and David says, the man whose sins have been atoned for. No, no, no. He says, the man whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose deeds I will not remember. Now, there's a very fine distinction in what Paul is saying here. We, we can understand justification broadly, but we need to understand it biblically. To say justification is just that we've been forgiven or granted a pardon isn't great because it's not really what the Bible says. So there's, there's a really fine, and you may think I'm splitting hairs here, but let me get to why this is an important distinction um, and why people throughout the ages have died 
over protecting faith alone. See, Paul is using a legal language here. In fact, as we continue to read, we're going to see these words counted, 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 declared over and over again in this text. In our text, we need to understand when we see that word counted, it's, it carries with it a connotation of a mathematical equation. It was actually a business term used in that, where it was something to be credited or charged towards someone. It's not the same as being transformed. So when we believe, when we express faith in Jesus, we are counted, we are declared, we are credited as righteous. We are declared by a judge who sees us. Through our faith, he sees us and he says, you're justified. You are not worthy of punishment. I see you as innocent, not guilty, pure. Now here's the fine distinction here. Okay? And I've fallen prey of falling on the wrong side of this, but this is it. When we believe in Jesus, when we are saved, we are not transformed into someone righteous. It's not that I am a B plus person and when Christ comes, I get the strength, the chest, and the chisel chin of Jesus. That's not what happens. When you're saved, when you believe, you are declared righteous. Look again at 4 verse 5. I'm not making this up. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. You see, justification is not something to happen that happens to those who are already right. It's something declared over those who are already ungodly. Justification isn't for the just, it's for the guilty. It's something granted to the ungodly through faith. You see, he, he, here's why this is important. We say trans, I mean, we are new. We see language of that, and you do. But here's why it's important. If you, when you believe, are transformed to have a new sort of being, of entity, of perfection, so let's say the law. If you're transformed to be this one who is the fulfillment of the law, the fulfillment of any sort of moral code, we'd have grounds to boast, wouldn't we? But why does God see you as righteous? Look at me. <laughs> I'm perfect. I've become wholly righteous in and of myself. Now, may, now maybe, I mean, Jesus, sure, he got me there, but I don't need him now. I don't need him in my fight against sin. I'm transformed into something new. I don't need him anymore. I have grounds for boasting, but Paul is removing that boast from our mouth. And he's saying, he's tying the existence of a believer from salvation through the rest of your life to the will and grace of God. It's a legal declaration over you. It's an imputation of something which was once foreign to us being declared as true for us, not on our own merit, but on the merit of somebody else. God refuses to count your sins against you, not because you're not worthy of your sins, but because, because God is dealing with them in another way. God has a different plan for how to deal with them. The life of faith is then not a life out of the power of your own righteousness, but it's wholly dependent on the person and work of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit empowering you to do something. So any form of holiness and righteousness you see in your life, you can say, yeah, I applied effort, but it's only by the grace of God. Because there's nothing more antithetical to humans than the righteousness of God. You don't become that. You're given that by God's holy and precious grace. We are still weak. Man, if I was transformed into something perfect and I sinned, what did I just say about God's transforming power? <laughs> you sucked. My kid threw a Cheerio at my face and I sinned. <laughs> Some Jesus. But if we are declared righteous, God's promise is still faithful because God still sees me, not as me being transformed, but is Christ being sufficient and we live in God's gracious assistance. You see, your faith, when you believe right now, most of you in here probably have some form of, yeah, I believe. But do you understand what that really means to you? Do you understand the miracle of faith? A wonderful declaration of a gracious God who sees your warts, acknowledges your blemishes, knows your limits, and holds it not against you 
because of your faith in Jesus Christ. Because, not of what you've done to merit his favor, but because of his merciful kindness to us. You heard it said once, somebody said, Christianity, I mean, that's the easiest religion. You don't have to do anything. Man, but for those of us who know what it means to be human, that's the hardest religion. Because we feel like we need to do something. We feel like we need to earn something. And that's not because we're super zealous go-getters. It's because we're selfish. It's because we're introverted. It's because we like to boast in ourself. You see, this is the core of what Protestantism is about of what it means to be a Christian, of what it means to be distinct from other religions, as you look at your salvation and you say, it's wholly through Jesus Christ. It's entirely dependent on Jesus Christ. You didn't go 50% and God picked it up the rest of the way. You didn't go 10% and God went 90. You didn't pass God's entrance exam to show you were worthy of entering his mercy. You didn't live a moral enough life where God saw you amongst the blackened people and he's like, there's a pure one, there's a white one, there's a clean one. It wasn't in relation to your white American privilege or socioeconomic status. You weren't granted mercy because God saw your shiny potential or because he was lonely and he needed a friend. You are saved because God is gracious to those who have faith in his son. And he will give you not mere entrance into his kingdom, but the righteousness of Christ himself. You see, we don't go to heaven because we deserve it. We go to heaven because Jesus has made us his plus one for all eternity to heaven's big dance. And no one, not even your own sin, can take that away because it's dependent upon Christ, not you. It's tied up in Jesus not our works. Paul says this in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. How many of you today have thought recently, I'm a Christian? The holy, righteous judge of the world looks at me who got a C on my anthropology exam and he says, you're righteous. You're not guilty. You're innocent and you get to spend eternity with me. But so many times we dumb down in our own minds because we're so introverted. We say, yeah, of course I'm a Christian. That makes perfect sense that I would be here. I have believed it for 15 years. Why would it be any different now? No, the reason you're a Christian is because God is faithful in your life through Jesus Christ. And that's the second point. The only reason faith is powerful is because Christ is sufficient. Now I want to preface something here. You are not a Christian. In light of everything I just said, this is the tension of faith alone, okay? I'm going to jump up and down on saved by faith, but I'm also going to say this. You are not a Christian because you have faith. Faith in and of itself does not save you. If if you are saved by mere faith, by the function of faith, isn't that just another form of works? God looks at you, you're exhibiting faith, yeah, you're saved. You're exhibiting faith, yeah, yeah, you're saved. Isn't that, I mean, really, can can we get around that? If that's all faith is, is the function of faith, God looks, who's gonna have faith today? You did it, you did it, you did it, yeah, yeah, you guys passed, come in. You see, here's the thing. If you were saved by mere faith, wouldn't Muslims be saved? They believe in God. Wouldn't Mormons be saved? They follow parts of Scripture. Wouldn't Hindus be? Faith is really important to Hindus. Faith is really important to spiritualists. Faith is really important to a lot of people. They all have faith. Even some have faith in God. But it's not in the Christian world. It's not faith that saves It's the object of that faith. And for Christians, that object isn't a vapor. It isn't something that vanishes. It isn't something that crumbles with age or is eroded by water or is dampered by teams that can't win. It's Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ saves us and we have access to that through faith. Now I'm gonna read the remaining uh, part of scripture uh, tonight. 
and, and I, I want to read it, and we're going to get to the end, and then I want to come back and address two things in light of the final verses um, that show how Christ shapes a life of faith. So we're reading verse 16 through 25, and it says this. For the promise of Abraham and his offspring, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir to the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if the adherents of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. Or if the promise is faith. If you work to do it, you nullify the promise. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherents of the law, for that doesn't save, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of God whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence things that do not exist. I love that line in terms of God's people. We see in Hosea, once you were not a people, but now you are a people. God calls his people into existence. In hope, Abraham believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told. So shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. See, he's not even boasting in the strength of his faith. He's giving glory to God for the strength of his faith. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours. It will also be counted to us who believe in him who, raises, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So Paul knows here, okay, we're talking about justification by faith alone. We're talking about this Jew named Abraham, not really relevant to his Roman Gentile Jew context, not really even relevant to us. And he knows that. He says, whoa, whoa, whoa hold up. What was written was not for Abraham only, not for the Jews only, not for first century, century Gentiles only. It's for you. It's for Christians. And it bears an impact in our life. The doctrine of faith alone gives us two uh, ways in which it shapes our life. Paul gives us two ways here. First, biblical faith is not blind faith, okay? Biblical faith is not blind faith. Of, of Abraham, we get this really vague line that's kind of hard to understand. In hope, he believed against hope. What does that really mean here? Well, Paul goes on to say that um, Abraham, so God promised Abraham to have a son. How many hundred year olds do you know who are popping out babies today? Not many, okay? Same was true in Abraham's day. And he said, Abraham, even though he saw himself as nearly dead, and then in your translation, it says he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. That's actually not the Greek word for barrenness. There's a different word. That he's, it's, it's, a, it's the same word, deadness. Abraham looked at himself as nearly dead. He looked at his wife whose womb was dead. And yet, in seeing those, he believed against it. In seeing those human trials and troubles, he believed against it. See, Abraham, because he had faith, didn't just say, oh, God's going to figure it out. These aren't really promises. I don't need to focus on these. These aren't problems. But he saw them. And even when it was counted him as righteousness, those problems didn't go away. When Abraham, when, when God said, I'm going to give you a son, Abraham's like, all right. He didn't turn into this 24-year-old young sprout running around. Sarah's womb wasn't enlivened with this newness of life. It didn't change. The problems of this world were still present, still there, still needed to be overcome. See, John Stott looked at this verse and he said that Abraham viewed the problems of this world in light of the promises of God. And that's a life of faith. You see, faith doesn't mean we don't doubt. Man, in this world, we're going to have plenty of times where we doubt God's goodness. Last year when we went through Mark, the, the cry of the father of the girl um, who, who had, uh, has a demon inside of her, he says, I believe, help my unbelief. Man, that's a perfect prayer for a Christian. We're going to have times of doubt. We have a very physical existence and God is present in this world, but not in the same way this is present. He's not physical. He can't be seen in the same way. Faith doesn't mean that we don't consider the obstacles that lay before us. It doesn't mean that it's easy to believe the promises of God. God promises it's more joyful to follow me and to obey me and to worship me than all the luxuries of the world. 
That's a hard one to believe by faith. Man, we sin because we disbelieve. We sin because we don't have faith that what God said is true and better for us is really true and better. We sin because when God says, you're adopted, you're my son, you belong, we say, I can belong somewhere else. And we have those lapses of faith, and it's hard. And those won't go away in this life. Faith doesn't mean that we're not saddened by evil and the horrors that go on campus shootings in Oregon today. It doesn't mean that we turn a blind eye and say, this is God's world anyway. What is all of this? Faith doesn't mean that we won't sin and we won't feel like a failure. What faith means is that we encounter, when we encounter the things of this world, we rest in the promise of a God who is greater than this world. And we view everything, not through the lens of man, but through the lens of Jesus Christ. You see, faith may be blind, but it's not without eyes. For those who believe, God has given us the eyes to see the promise of God in Jesus Christ. Why do we believe? Because we see Christ who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. We don't believe blindly. We believe boldly in the power of God. Christian faith is not distant. We don't live with our heads in the clouds. We live with our hearts buried in Christ Jesus doesn't mean we're ignorant of our worlds and our troubles, but it means we move towards them, live in them, and hope through them because above all else, we see the promise of God and we know it's true because Jesus is risen from the dead. Secondly, and probably most fantastically, Paul goes on uh, to describe the wonderful misremembrance God had for people of faith. Paul describes the life of Abraham in 19 through 21 and listen to what he said. If you guys had VBS, if you guys are familiar with uh, the book of Genesis, see what Paul says here and then we're gonna go and look and see what happens in Genesis. What does Paul say about Abraham? He did not weaken in his faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised, okay? For those of you who are familiar with what went on in Genesis, I don't know what book Paul was reading here. That's not true of Abraham. Genesis 15, God says, Abraham, uh, Sarah's gonna have a son, and he says, "Uh, I'm 100 years old, and she's barren. You should pick somebody else. (laughs) He's not like, well, that makes complete sense, God, that you would choose almost dead people to bear children. And then that passes, and so, so Genesis 5, or 15, 6, we see that verse we looked at earlier. He believed after Abraham's like, not me, God. It says Abraham's finally like, he believed and it was counted him as righteousness. We say, he's got it from there, right? He believed, it counted him as righteousness. You know what happens? That's chapter 15. You know what happens in chapter 16? Sarah's like, Abraham, I'm old. Take my servant. Get her pregnant. Maybe that's the way God's gonna do it. And Abraham was like, okay, that makes sense. It took like a paragraph break for Abraham to say, yeah, I know God said he was going to provide a child through Sarah, but that doesn't make sense, so I'm going to take matters into my own hands. And he conceived with Hagar. I said, okay, maybe God, God t- talks to Abraham after that. He's like, no, that was bad news, Abraham. You shouldn't have done that. That was a lack of faith, and it, you're going to have issues with this now. The son of Hagar and the son of Sarah are always going to be fighting. And so we say, okay, Abraham figured it out. Chapter 17 of Genesis rolls around. Abraham goes to this land and there's this king named Abimelech and kings in that day when they saw beautiful women, they take beautiful women and they typically kill their husbands. Abraham's like, I have a hot wife. He sees Abimelech and he tells Sarah, hey hey Sarah, you should say you're my sister so that even if he takes you, he doesn't kill me. And so he goes and he lies before Abimelech. Now, Now wait, at this point, pop quiz, do Abraham and Sarah have a child? No, not outside, of, not, not outside of the child they had with Hagar, okay? They don't have the child to promise. What did God promise? A child. And yet Abraham goes and is deceiving and lying and sinning because he doesn't trust that God's really gonna come through with that promise. Look, maybe Abraham doesn't understand that when God promises you're gonna have a kid, you're pretty integral in that process. He lies, he deceives, he's manipulative. Yet, Because of his faith, Paul gives him a stellar report card in Romans 4. 
None of that is mentioned. Don't you find that weird? Why is that? It's because Abraham, because he lived a life of faith, he received the blessed gift of faith. The author of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 10, verses 14 and then 17 and 18. For by a single offering, he, that's Jesus, has perfected all those who are being sanctified. And then in verse 17, then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. See, this is what faith does to us. Faith does not only remove our sin from us, but it also takes Christ's righteousness, Christ's goodness, and it applies it to us. You see, it would have been great if justification returned us to neutral, where we could start on a positive ground. But it positioned us with the righteousness, not of a pastor, not of a priest, not of Abraham, not of Moses, not of Paul, not of Mother Teresa, but with the righteousness of Christ himself. You see, there's this old phrase that people use in remembering what justification means. Justification means uh, just as if I'd never sinned. But what Paul is proving here is that justification is also just as if I've always obeyed. He looks at what Abraham did and he said, that's a man of faith. That's a man that though he messed up, though he sinned, he got back up. He repented. He believed. He grew. He glorified God. You see, here's where this comes home for us tonight. How do you know you're a Christian? How do you know that you are viewed in the court of God, that you are declared righteous and pure? How do you know your hope past the grave? How do you know your joy in this life? Your answer needs to be what Paul concluded with, that I believe in Christ Jesus, who was delivered up for your sins, because you deserve them. But he was also raised for your justification, that in the, death, in the sin-killing death Christ had, you also might have sin killed and you might also be raised with him. We stand before God. If you have faith, you stand before God robed in the righteousness of Christ himself. And in that, we have a declaration which is so foreign to us that that only in the most wonderful way can we actually believe it's true. And yet in the gospel, it is wonderfully true and it is wholly ours. You see, the doctrine of the justification by faith alone is not this idea that we can understand and say that's good theology. But it's a doctrine of boasting. Not in yourself who has achieved, but in Christ who has gone before us. In Christ who has secured our righteousness. In Christ who has defeated your death. In Christ who has commissioned your life. In Christ whom you believe. We boast not in ourselves, but in the power and work of Jesus Christ through the sin-killing death on the cross. And here's what it produces. Rest. Rest for you. Rest from the hardship of this world by knowing the promise of God who rests not in your ability, not in your potential, not in circumstances, but in Christ who is faithful. That's the beauty of being declared righteous in Jesus Christ. That's what we should remind ourselves of when we go to bed at night. That's what should wake us in the morning is today. Because of Christ Jesus, I am not who I am. I am who Christ is. I don't have the power of Christ in my veins, but Christ has given me all of his power through my faith as a gift today, tomorrow, the next day when you wake up and when you believe. So rejoice and be glad for great is your reward in heaven and great is that declaration here on earth. Let's pray. God, we thank you for Christ Jesus. We thank you that uh, As we talked about two weeks ago, the good news of the gospel is first the bad news about us. And Christ was delivered up for our sins, but he was also raised for our justification. Lord, I pray for those in here um, who claim to believe. God, overwhelm us with our faith. 
overwhelm us with the declaration of God and looking at his people and saying, innocent, because Christ has borne the guilt. Free, because Christ has borne the penalty. Loved, because Christ has earned and lived inside the wrath on the cross. Lord, let us not be mindless of our faith, but let us drive us to boast in you, to grow in faith, and to glorify the God who gives us strength to live and a pardon to worship. Praise in your name. Amen.